I want you to imagine that in the tree right outside of this house, which is a very little lovely holly tree, there is a giant snake, size that must have been the snake that Eve looked at in the Garden of Eden. And I come up to you, and you're the gardener for that tree. You've been tending it all your life. 30, 40 years you've been tending that tree, and you've never seen a snake in it. And I run up to you and say, look, there's a snake in that tree over there. Now, the first thing that runs into your mind is this fellow's crazy. But I'm sort of persistent, and I say to you, now, please, I want you to get rid of that snake in that tree. It should be clear to you that you couldn't get rid of that snake in that tree. And so, if you were to try to, you would spend many fruitless hours. What you do know is that I, coming to you with a story about a snake in that tree, I am hypnotized. And you know that the only way to make me realize there's no snake in the tree is to awaken me. On the other hand, if you were to take my word for it and then proceed to try to remove the snake from that tree, you too would be hypnotized. And both of us would now be in the same boat. Now, when you look out on this world and when you see evil, you are not aware of the hypnosis for one reason. The fellow next to you sees it too. And the fellow next to him sees it as well. And so you have no method for determining that you are hypnotized. Neither have I any method for determining that you are hypnotized because I see the evil that you see. And every man, woman, and child on the earth sees the same evil, and therefore none of them could come to the conclusion that the other fellow is hypnotized. Only one could know this. He would have to be in a consciousness as Jesus was to look at mankind and say, why, the poor fellows are hypnotized. They're all seeing snakes in a little holly tree, and there isn't any. And this is by way of preface to the snake in the Garden of Eden. This should have been to mankind the clue that they were not in the creation of God. This should have been the clue to mankind that every evil, every snake, is but the hypnosis of the human mind. And both Adam and Eve, under this hypnosis, seeing what didn't exist, constitute the hypnotic state of the human race. Now, in the first chapter of Genesis, which we want to dwell on a little more today, we have a perfect spiritual kingdom. It's as if you sat down to design a building, and you design all of it, to your complete satisfaction and you have this perfect blueprint of all of the levels how they're going to be integrated how they're going to serve each other the materials even an estimate of the amount of time it will take to build it the cost everything is finished but nothing has been built it's simply a completed idea now, in God's kingdom, the completed idea is the first chapter of Genesis, the complete, total, spiritual kingdom. It even goes a step further. The six days represent the appearance in sequence in spiritual manifestation of the basic absolute idea. First the absolute idea, then in various periods each idea comes forward into manifestation 
for you and I to understand it. Each is moving simultaneously from its position into the next position so that there is a spontaneous manifestation of the one idea in a period called six days. Now, of course, the six days representing no particular time, you must see why. And this will end that debate. When the Father, when God created his idea, there was not yet any day. There was no such thing as a day. There was no such thing as a sun or an earth revolving around a sun. And this little earth revolving around sun, this pygmy in God's creation, which we measure days by, had not yet been created, so there was no such thing to measure day by. And this is merely for the purposes of elucidation to make it somewhat comprehensible for the human mind. Now, God created in the beginning, and that beginning doesn't mean in the beginning of time. It means the origin. In the origin, the genesis of all things before there was a world, before there was time, there was a plan, a divine plan in a divine mind called heaven and earth. And this heaven and this earth represent the high and the low, represent what even comes down eventually to being male and female, heaven being male and earth being female, ever seeking to find one another, each seeking the other, heaven to impregnate earth with the idea of the divine and earth to find heaven to find the idea of the divine, ever seeking oneness. And this heaven and earth are not the heaven and earth that we know. This heaven and earth spoken there is not this earth, and it is not this heaven. This is the plan behind the various manifestations in spirit and finally in the physical. This is the unchanging earth, the unchanging heaven. Not this earth spinning around a sun, this is the spiritual earth. Even before it became a spiritual earth. You're going to see what I mean in a moment. Now this heaven, this earth, or the positive, negative, the male, female, the high, the low, the one. Complete, absolute, perfect, and from them in six days evolved that divine heaven and earth which has been ideated in the mind of God. Now you will notice that God created the heaven and the earth. And that is a very strange word because created doesn't mean that he made heaven and earth. Created means something else than made. Made means something different than created. And that I would like you to see. In a sense, let's put it this way. You turn out a lamp and you create darkness. Now you didn't make that darkness. You turned out the lamp and thus created darkness. It is in the sense that creation is used in the word created. There is a car on a hill and a brick is holding it. You do not touch the car, you remove the brick. Now did you move the car? No, but because you removed the brick you caused the motion of the car. This too is the implication in creation. There is a wood resting or a beam resting on a pillar and you remove the pillar and the beam falls down. 
Did you move the beam or did you move the pillar? And so we're going to see a distinction between made and create. To make is to make something specific which is forever. To create conveys a different significance that is only visible or apprehensible as you become acquainted with the unfoldment of the six days. Now on the first day, we have a very unusual thing. We have the Spirit of God, we have the earth, we have the darkness, We have another. And I want you to see one puzzling thing there, that he is speaking about the spiritual creation of the four elements. And darkness represents fire. He's speaking in the spirit of God, he's speaking of the air. In the darkness, he's speaking of the fire. And the earth that he's speaking of is now not the earth that we know of, but earth that he speaks of in creating heaven and earth means everything in the above and that earth in heaven and earth represents the four elements. This is the earth which is a category comprising the four elements, one of which is also the earth. You're going to find another earth later. This earth is the spiritual idea of four elements which later fuse together make possible the various individual living creatures in the creation. And so this earth is everything below the heaven. Heaven and that below it is called the earth and it isn't referring to this earth, the mother earth, the female earth, but rather is a more comprehensive term including the four elements of fire, air, water, and earth. And he mentions them right there in the first day to clarify what he's speaking of. And it was necessary for this idea to be first so that the later ideas of life as we know it could be germinated in these four elements. Now as you watch carefully, you're going to see spheres set in motion and then you're going to see a great panorama in which all of the spheres, sort of like giant egg beaters, moving through the four elements with the light shining and darkness as well in a sort of psychedelic light pattern. These egg beaters or motions of spheres through the four elements create all of the combinations in an infinite variety which eventually terminate as the ideas which produce life in the air, on the land, and on the sea. Now, from the invisible idea comes an invisible manifestation which never reaches the human eye. In this invisible manifestation, we have the six days. These six days are the bringing forth into spiritual manifestation the one spiritual idea of heaven and earth. And always you will discover that in the manifestation something happens which in the visible later will eventuate as things trying to come together trying to return to a state of oneness from which they have departed. And so you'll see in all life there is this coming together of the male and the female, for it all starts with the oneness of heaven and earth. Then, branching out into four elements, and we're still in the realm of spiritual manifestation, not in physical manifestation. Now we're going to have to go to it to detail it a little more finely. The earth was without void, without form and void. 
I want to introduce an idea right here that there is an Aramaic and a Hebraic scripture which is somewhat different than this. Without form in the Aramaic and void in the Aramaic is um, translated to be without form is translated as mourning M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G the earth was mourning and void is translated crying and the reason for this is that the Aramaic is translated from the well I guess the original Aramaic the words are toha and boha and these are the meanings of them crying mourning now this introduces an idea which has been veiled from the world and the idea becomes very clear as you begin to probe deeper here you will see the implication of earth as having life of itself a life irrespective of your life and my life but a life in which there is an essence which can mourn and which can cry and this is a literal meaning which does not bear interpretation it means what it says it means that the earth was mourning and crying and it is telling us that this earth which was void and without form was so for a reason and this develops as you come forth into certain passages here and you find the idea of a sensitivity a life being built up a life that is present outside of earth a life that is omnipresent outside of earth a life outside of earth a life that is in the stars is in all of the objects that we see outside of earth a very upsetting and yet a very welcome idea as you begin to warm up to it and you will find it developed here very carefully to show us that earth at the moment of this creation being void and barren formless was something that happened because of a divine idea that in this formless void something was actually taking place called a darkness a darkness was there and now God is going to separate the light from the darkness and this is the same relationship as creating described a moment ago when you bring up a light you create a darkness there's only the darkness without light and you're not creating it you're not aware of it but the moment you bring up a light darkness becomes a fact that wasn't known before all of the things that are called creation then are not something that is made but something that happens because something else is done you bring up a light and this makes a darkness now you have the light and the darkness you will find then whenever creation is used biblically it is not something that is exactly made directly but something that is formed through something else being done and what else is being done is the mystery that we must uncover because that mystery is pointed up in a very unique way in the second day you will discover the second day is the only day in which God does not look and say it was very good and there is a reason and that reason is the mystery of mysteries 
why the second day was not pronounced very good, whereas every other day was. And perhaps we can discover it. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. The deep being all that was below heaven. There was darkness. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now we have here the darkness, the Spirit of God, the air, the darkness, the fire, and the earth. And these are the elements now in formation. And God says, let there be light. And there was light. Now who did God say that to? Was there anyone he could talk to? We are seeing here a spontaneous divine mind idea expressed in terminology that is perhaps very graphic, but was seeing a thought, a divine thought personalized by saying, God said, let there be light. And there was light. Now this light wasn't the sun. This was the fact of light itself, that there is light. The sun was yet to come. Now is this the light Jesus spoke of when he said, I am the light? Is this the light Jesus spoke of when he said, ye are the light of the world? Would this light then be a life itself, without which there is no life? Is this the light which we are waiting to be illumined by? Is this the light that we seek when we talk of enlightenment? God said, let there be light. Now this light pulsed through the Spirit of God. What is the difference between spirit and light? Can we see that light is the vehicle which forms the invisible patterns of God's thought and as that thought touches the spirit of God they intertwine in a pattern of that thought. Spirit becomes the animated thought and that animated thought in spirit becomes light. And so we have a universe invisible of spirit animated by thought which becomes a pattern a continuous unseparated infinite pattern of divine thought expressed as light in pattern pattern light waves but invisible infinite without separation and this is the perfect invisible creation. This is heaven and earth now transferred into a pattern of light. And it is the distortion of this light which eventually causes the appearance of a snake or of an evil or of a tidal wave. Now we have the pattern of light behind the visible universe. And this pattern is first light itself, unimpregnated with thought, ready now to receive the heaven and earth creation into itself so that the life becomes heaven and earth itself in pattern. And now each day these patterns are formed as heaven and earth in God's mind is impressed upon the light. First the light, and then the things that will follow. God saw the light and that it was good. Now good means, yes, this is my divine idea perfectly transformed into light. That's the meaning of good. The light is exactly what I want. The light will do the job 
the light is perfect. Everything so far is exactly as it should be. And you cannot remove one whit of it and maintain that absolute perfection as man later will try to do. This is good. This will fit. Now the first invisible story of that blueprint is finished. We're going to the second floor. How many days did it take? It didn't take a second. There was no time yet. This was an eternity. And this is the eternal plan slowly unfolding itself to a spiritual consciousness which Moses obviously communed with and was able to receive his enlightenment. Now we're in the first day. God is now dividing light from darkness. Now this light and this darkness are a problem because in God there was no darkness at all. And so you see, until we knew that this was the invisible word for fire, this darkness, we now have light and fire. One is transparent and one is not. One is capable, one is the highest form of activity above the earth, above the waters, above the air, and there is the fire, the eternal fire in the heavens from which all things must spring, which being fused with the air, fused with the water above the earth, and fused with the earth becomes a manifestation which later can appear as this world. Now as we rest in the eternal silence of the Father, all of this is happening at one moment. The actual creation is a simultaneous creation. It isn't divided into periods of time, but it comes forth into manifestation at different periods in the invisible. And now we're watching that the light and darkness is going to come forth and the air and the, the fire is going to come forth in new combinations, making the second delineation possible. You're watching on an infinite level, you're watching vapor become water, become ice. You're watching vapor solidify, uh, evaporate or uh, condense into water. You're watching water solidify into ice. But you're watching it on an infinite level. And now it's the four elements which precede the water and then the water will become solidified into the ice. And this is the spiritual evolvement of consciousness unfolding. As each degree is transformed into the next degree, just as you in your own mind would transform one idea into another, each would pyramid into another idea, evolving into a final manifestation and here these ideas are being wedded one to the other each dependent on the one before it as from the spirit you come into the spiritual manifestation without the fifth step the fourth the sixth wouldn't be possible without the fourth the third wouldn't be possible and they come in the sequence because each sequence makes the next possible before God can say, now it's completed, perfect, nothing to be added, nothing to be subtracted, it's all good, it's finished, it's right. And then the perfect creation stands there 
waiting now in perfect spiritual manifestation for you and I to open our consciousness and to admit it into our human mind which has blotted it out unknown to itself. Now as we completely understand these various degrees we will come to a point where we can see a moment not in time and not in eternity but a moment which we're coming to now which will answer a question somebody asked me when did we get off the beam and this is in the second day when God doesn't say it's good now the firmament here there are three firmaments I believe in this first creation there are two earths there are all kinds of water and there are two heavens and so they have to be clarified now here this firmament that is going to come between the waters divide the waters the firmament is the unexplained mystery you'll discover that this firmament is going to be spiritually that gap between eternity and time and the reason it isn't spoken of as good is this only when something is finished does God call it good not when it's still in a process of evolving when God pronounces something good it is permanent it is completed it is established it is a foreverness now the manifestation of the second day was not a completion and it will not be a completion until you and I make it so until you and I learn about the water above the earth and learn how to live there in consciousness then that manifestation will be complete then it will be good this is the one area where we must dwell in consciousness in order to find in ourselves a meaning that cannot be given to us by any person on earth this is the area where we make an admission to ourselves of something that few have been able to make and that is that this earth that we stand on is not God's creation this earth that we walk on and live in is not God's creation that's the meaning signified by it was mourning it was crying now God made heaven and earth but not this earth and your clue to that is that on this earth there is an evil serpent <coughs> appearing in the Garden of Eden on this earth and so we're not on God's earth omnipotence doesn't permit evil on God's earth we're on the earth created in the mind of man but there is an earth which God created an invisible earth a spiritual earth and our coming into the realization of that spiritual earth is the reason it was not able to be said that it was good on the second day this firmament that divides the waters 
brings the waters that become the low, the earth, below this firmament, and the waters that become the true earth are above this firmament. And the true earth above the firmament are the waters and the false earth below the firmament eventuates as this earth. Now, the difference is strictly one of consciousness. We live and move and have our being in the earth that mourns and cries, which was formless and void because It is not the embodiment of God's spiritual idea. Now, I will set this clock at, let's say, four o'clock right now. It's four o'clock. Now, I can look at this time any time I wish, but it'll never tell me the correct time anymore until I fix those hands. Now, that's the situation with the human mind. Whenever you look through it, it's like looking at the clock in which the hands have been set incorrectly. You will always see what that mind sees, but the hands of that mind are not set on the right time. And so as you look out of it, you're going to see things that aren't there. I will see four o'clock, but it isn't four o'clock. And in an hour, I'm going to see five o'clock, and it won't be five o'clock, but I'll see it. And you're going to look out of a human mind and see snakes, as Eve did, you're going to look out of a human mind and see all kinds of things and say, I see them, without knowing that the dials of your mind are set incorrectly. And so as long as you're looking through it, you will be looking at that which is not true. You will be looking and saying, there's evil, there's an earthquake, there's a headache, there's a cold, there's a problem. And nothing in the world will convince you that the dials of your mind are telling you the incorrect time. And yet the Christ mind is set at the right time. Now the Christ mind lives in the waters above the firmament as well as below. The human mind lives in the waters below the firmament. Now that isn't all there is to it. You may discover when you enter the soul realm that there is an inversion between the soul and the mind. The soul looks out one way, the mind looks the opposite way. Cannot see what is in the soul, and the soul cannot bring to it the divine idea. Now this firmament is the separation between soul and mind, which finally comes out as an illegitimate human race, disconnected in thought from its parent, earth disconnected from heaven, and yet never really separate but thinking so. Earth and heaven are always one in spirit, but in the visible you see the earth and seek the heaven. Now, there are passages in here which have never been brought to your attention in any of the teachings that I know in which certain things come alive that have never been noticed. And unless you have come to a place in consciousness where you can say the earth that I live in is a human mind creation completely blocked off from that which is. These statements to follow will be meaningless to you. But if you have reached a glimpse of that yourself, you will see down here when God makes the two great lights, the greater to rule the day and the lesser to rule the night, that the reason we have passed over this is because we have not understood the totality of its meaning. You see, first he puts the lights in the firmament of heaven to give light. Now, 
these lights that are giving light to earth that's one thing but now he adds the thought which we have slurred over God made two great lights the greater to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night the word rule is used with intent it means to rule it means precisely that and now you are seeing that life is existent in that which we call the sun and that which we call the moon we are giving them names but they are not the sun and the moon they are spiritual life and it is said that they are to rule the earth and it means to rule the earth in other words there is life there that you are not aware of these words have too often been taken to mean some kind of uh, imaginative way of speaking but they don't mean that at all they mean precisely that there is life to rule the earth and so you're beginning to understand that there is a world in which angels do live now we on earth as human beings have begun to think of ourselves as the end product of God's greatest creation but we have only presumed that we are the man that God created and we aren't we are not the end product of God's creation we are a false mental idea learning that the reality of us is the end product of God's creation but that this is not the reality of us now these things these lights that are to rule the earth they are ruling the earth at this moment and now you become aware that life has no blank spaces there's no absence of life anywhere life is a total infinite inseparable thing and that the inhabitant of all of this life is God itself and is the one inhabitant and so man has to come out of a little mental shell of vanity and conceit and begin to open open up to invisible omnipresent life which is ever reaching him probing him educating him lifting him trying to bring him out of a wilderness a mourning and a crying earth where duality is prevalent where the opposites of truth are flitting all over and where man the false the imitation image of man with a capital M is besieged by these opposites at a loss to explain them ever running from one shadow to the next saying how can I the image and likeness of God be so besieged never realizing that he is not the image and likeness of God and that he is to be ruled by a power far greater than his limited mental self and that as he finds this power and lets it lift him into his, his its rhythm the serpents on the tree the earthquakes the diseases the various levels of human consciousness which do not know God will be opened up and then we will get a glimpse of that man which we are that divine image and likeness now this is by way of prelude I think to say that we each are the center of a world I'm the center of a world you're the center of a world every individual is the center of his world we are all worlds within worlds but there is one divine seed invisible to us all but implanted in us all and it is only the attainment of the awareness of that divine seed in you that lifts you from the man who walks in the shadows of evil 
unable to comprehend them or to defend against them. And that man with his human mind can never overcome these evils. That man is always pronouncing a snake in the tree and always trying to do something about it because he is looking at a tree that isn't there and seeing a snake in it. The tree itself isn't there. The material world isn't there. And as long as you look what isn't there, whatever you see in it isn't there. And this is the nature of the total hypnosis which is described in the second and third chapters of Genesis. Before that hypnosis, we're given the perfect ideation and the perfect manifestation of it invisibly. And then suddenly, like a movie director, Moses behind the scene says, cut from this scene, come over to that one. Now we'll get a close-up. Let's go down to that earth, which was manifested invisibly in spirit, and now let's get a close-up. And let's show right there how foolishly something in man has translated the perfection of what is into the imperfection of what is not. Now, I think this might be a good pause. Let's get a glass of water, and then we'll go back to our perfect creation, which can never leave us, is ever present.